we're going to talk today about uh, something that has been on my mind for a couple of months and i've been researching and investigating and i'm really excited to share this information with you all so hopefully uh, it'll be useful all right it's 6 o'clock today and uh, let's get going um i'm going to share my screen uh, so that you guys can look at uh, what i'm presenting and um So uh today I wanted to talk about um a unique topic that has not actually ever been addressed in any of the conferences or any of the discussions on the low carb forums or the low carb sites and it relates in many ways to fasting and low carb diets movement or exercise and sleep and that is called calorie restriction so what is calorie restriction actually mean and what my objectives for today's presentation are so my objectives are to define what calorie restriction is go through how we know it is helpful for us based on animal studies based on human data we going to define the biology of hunger i mean how do you control hunger what are the factors that make us hungry and then finally any presentation i give i want to make it practical for you i want to make it so that you are able to practice calorie restriction by methods and techniques that i'm going to explain to you about now at the outset i want to say that intermittent fasting does not contradict with calorie restriction because when you do intermittent fasting in some ways you're practicing calorie restriction because intermittent fasting reduces the size of the stomach it gives you better control of a hunger hormone called ghrelin we'll explore that further the reduction in insulin levels makes you eat less and there is better functioning of a satiety hormone called leptin now up until recently you know i've been fairly successful in getting people to reduce their weight reduce their insulin resistance and they have improved their health however there is a substantial proportion of patients like for example i was talking to the daughter of one of my colleagues and she's been doing intermittent fasting she's been doing a low carb diet and yet not losing weight perhaps the tool that she's lacking is calorie restriction and the way i define that is that humans are designed to overeat the paleolithic humans before us before modern humans had to hunt for food food was not consistently available so they went through periods of involuntary fasting on a regular basis and in order to protect us from famine our biology is designed to overeat when food is available what was helpful to us in the paleolithic times is hurting us because modern humans have mastered agriculture there is availability of food there is a refrigerator in your home so your paleolithic instincts your human instincts have not evolved to deal with this food availability and that's the reason why overeating and obesity is so common in addition food manufacturers have engineered our food they have made the food such that we would overeat if you take a bag of chips the hotness index the spicy index of that chip varies from chip to chip with a specific purpose that is designed to make you overeat because they profit from that 
So what is the animal data on calorie restriction? Now, this is a study in mice. So this study in mice, a group of mice were taken. And if you look at the top line, and here is my uh, arrow, this, line, this group of mice were fed ad libitum. That means that they were given as much food as they wanted. The next group below them, they were given about 20% less calories. So their calorie restriction was by 20%. The third group, which we will just take as the 40 kilocalories per week, they were reduced, they reduced their calories by about 65%. The ad lib mouse, they are heavier, they almost reach about 50 grams. With 20% less calories, they are around 35 grams. With 65% less calories, they're about 18 to 20 grams. So that is their weight. But how long did each of this group live when calories were restricted? So what has shown that when you restrict calories in mice, not only do you increase their average lifespan, but you increase their maximum lifespan. Let's show that a little bit more clearly. So these are the group of mice that were fed ad libitum, however much they wanted. They all died at 35 months. The group that was restricted by 20% lived about seven months longer. But look what's happening to the group that were restricted by 65%. They lived at up to 55 months, 20 months longer. So what I wanted to tell you is that it prolonged the life of these mice by almost 65%. So people will say mice are not human-like, the information in mice is not useful. So this is information from uh, the Wisconsin uh, Primate Research Center. They have rhesus monkeys, rhesus macaque monkeys from India. And they did calorie restriction experiments in monkeys. They took about 76 monkeys, 38 they studied their feeding behavior. In fact, they studied the feeding behavior of all 76 animals before and saw how much they were eating. Um, in the 38 that they utilized for ad libitum group, which meant that they ate as much as they were eating before, the other 38, their calories were restricted by about 30%. Now, monkeys in captivity live for between 28 to 40 years. So this study was not a short duration study. This study was carried out for 20 years of follow-up. A typical pharmaceutical trial is only lasting about one to five years. So this duration of follow-up is humongous. These monkeys are not fed the diet like we advocate from the fasting method or any low carb community. These animals were given the same junk food that Americans eat, which is, I'm written as the standard American diet. They were given some protein in the form of lactalbumin, but there was a lot of sugar and corn oil, vegetable oil, which is not bad, which is very bad for us. The control diet had more calories, the restricted diet had fewer calories. They were reduced by the same percentage, but an important aspect of both rat as well as the rhesus monkey studies is that malnutrition was avoided by giving them important vitamins and minerals. The animals were recruited in three different phases. The first phase, this was because of funding. There was a period one in which they enrolled about 30 animals. Then another time they enrolled 30 animals that were mostly females and then they enrolled another eight. So they ended up with at least 15 females in the ad libitum group and 15 females in the group that were calorie restricted. 
Now, as I said, this study was carried out for 20 years. There was an interim analysis at about eight years um, in 2000. And this paper was published. And in the interim analysis, they looked at the difference in weight between the group that was given as much food as they wanted versus calorie restricted. So this group, which was given as much food as they wanted was heavier. The calorie restricted group was lighter. This was the second enrollment period. Within 24 months, these curves started separating. The ad libitum group were heavier. The calorie restricted groups were lighter, quite significantly in all three groups. What happened to their fat mass? So this is total and regional fat mass. In the control group, the fat mass was much higher compared to the group that had undergone dietary restriction or calorie restriction. It was lower not only in the abdomen, but in all places. So these animals were lighter. Now, one of the surrogate markers of better health is blood sugar levels and insulin levels. If you looked at blood sugar levels, the blood sugar levels were lower in the animals that were calorie restricted. Insulin level was significantly lower. This is the first group. These were the second two groups that were enrolled, blood sugar levels being low in the calorie restricted group compared to the control groups, insulin levels being low. Leptin is an important hormone that is elaborated by the fat cells. If your fat cells increase in size and number, less leptin is made. So the control group that had a lot more fat, I guess I'm saying that uh, the um, opposite way, when you have a lot of fat, a lot more leptin is made and the leptin was higher. When your fat mass is lower, less leptin is made. However, as you become heavy and if you have higher insulin, the brain does not see leptin and you're leptin resistant and you don't get the same satiety signals. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, in this uh, rhesus monkey study, there was a 20 year follow up. Their diet was controlled for two decades. So in other words, in this experimental program, they could exactly determine how much food we gave to these monkeys. It's not like a human trial in which we cannot control these factors. The Wisconsin Primate Research Center is a high quality facility. These animals were monitored every day. Their death rate was precisely assessed. And chronic diseases, unfortunately, rhesus monkeys have the same chronic problems, uh, chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancers, and brain atrophy like humans do. Now, at the end of 20 years, this is a representative sample of a monkey that was fed ad libitum versus calorie restriction. You can clearly see that this monkey looks a lot older. You can see that this posture is that of an older person with significant degree of hair loss. This is a calorie restricted monkey. He looks younger in his face. His posture is better. The hair quality is better. But I guess you guys don't care about all of this. What you want to know is that did they live longer? And if you looked at age-related mortality, not mortality that was as a result of injury or surgeries, this is in blue, the monkeys that were fed as much food as they wanted, 50% of them were dead by about 20 years of follow-up. On the other hand, in red are the calorie restricted monkeys. At 20 years of follow-up, 80% of them were alive. So at any given time, the calorie restricted monkeys had a threefold higher chance of living 
compared to the monkeys that were fed as much food as they wanted. Like we discussed, monkeys also die of cancers, heart disease, and diabetes. If again you looked at this bar, this graph, and you looked at the calorie restricted monkeys, they had a much lower chance of getting these chronic diseases, of acquiring these chronic diseases compared to the monkeys that were in the control group. In fact, almost all the monkeys in the control group got some kind of a chronic disease or another, whereas nearly 70% of monkeys in the calorie restricted group were free of chronic diseases. Now, I wanna give you a little balance from the uh, rhesus monkey studies because there was another group at the National Institute of Aging that did a similar study. Now, I don't wanna go into details because I wanna spend time up with what I think is important but in the NIA study, there was a significant reduction in chronic diseases and there was the same direction in terms of reducing mortality, but it didn't reach statistical significance. And there are differences in which the NIA designed their studies versus the University of Wisconsin designed their studies. And I think those are really the reasons why it is responsible for differences in outcome. And for people who are more interested, I am going, I'm writing a paper and I will show you the paper here. This is the paper and it is an exhaustive document with references and Melissa is gonna post it. Uh, it's gonna be posted on the website of IDM and the fasting method. So you will have access to it. So that's why I wanted to show you that a paper has already been written that'll get posted. So you would say monkeys are still not humans. What is the human data? So I wanna take you through what we know. During World War II, there were several European countries that restricted food intake of their population. One of the countries was Nor Norway, in Oslo, Norway. They said, we're gonna do 20% calorie reduction for you because it's wartime, Second World War, we can't feed you. But they said that we're gonna to try to provide you with balanced food. They gave them fresh vegetables, potatoes, fish, whole cereal, still not the best diet that I would recommend, but there was enough variety. And that was to prevent malnutrition. It was undernutrition, but not malnutrition. When compared to pre-war levels in both men and women, there was a 30% reduction in mortality. Many of us have heard about the Okinawa effect. Okinawa is an island in Japan where it was found on a research survey that these Okinawans ate about 17% less food than mainland Japanese and roughly about 40% less compared to the Americans. And when you looked at the lifespan, the average lifespan and the maximum lifespan, the Okinawans had about a four to five fold better chance than let's say the United States or the United Kingdom of reaching 100 years of age. Their average lifespan was increased by about two years and their maximum lifespan was extended by four years. So there is some evidence based on demographic studies that calorie restriction is beneficial. But you will say, hey, is there any randomized trial in humans? Have you taken a group of humans and you mashed them before and to half of them, you gave them less calories and the other half you said, feed ad libitum, however much you wanted. So my response to that is that that is difficult. 
The reason it is difficult is because to get an outcomes data like death rate or mortality, you would need about 30 years of observation. It would also be impossible to be certain that these humans are doing calorie restriction and impose it on them for that many years. On the other hand, you can do short-term studies in which you get surrogate markers of health, like weight, like metabolic rate, like energy expenditure. I will define that further, like insulin levels, triglycerides, and blood pressure. So a study like this was done. They enrolled about 218 patients about 117 completed the study in the group that were calorie restricted. They were divided a little differently. Uh, in other words, 145 were in the group initially, 75 were there in the other group. Of the 145, 117 agreed to do the intervention. Of the 75, 71 were able to complete. So let's see what happened to these individuals. So now here we are looking on this graph the amount of calorie restriction. How good were they at restricting calories over time? In the first six months, they were able to do 20% calorie restriction that was advised, but the amount of calorie restriction between six to 12, 12 to 18 and 18 to 24 months declined. So on an average, they restricted 10% of their calories over two years. What happened to their weight? This is weight loss over time. This is the unrestricted group. This is the restricted group. They lost an average of eight kilograms. That's roughly about 20 pounds. It's impressive. Now, let me tell you what metabolic rate is. Metabolic rate is when we take fuel and burn it for energy. So that is the oxidative phosphorylation big term. But basically, when you are burning fuel for energy, you create a little bit of burn injury. That's called oxidative injury. So higher your metabolic rate, perhaps faster your aging because you're creating more free radicals that will cause you to age. So a reduction in your metabolic rate, a reduction in your total daily energy expenditure could be a marker that you are aging at a lower rate. And with calorie restriction, you found that the resting metabolic rate as well as total daily energy expenditure got reduced. Now, we already know that insulin is a surrogate marker of health. Less insulin, more effective insulin works, the better the health is. And HOMA IR is a marker of how well your insulin is working. Lower is better. So the HOMA IR fell in these humans that were calorie restricted compared to not calorie restricted at both 12 and 24 months their blood pressure declined. Their blood pressure declined significantly, which is another marker of health. Now, um, the slide got a little bit out of place, but here is the slide. Now, another good marker of health are triglycerides. Triglycerides is fat and blood. Having less amount of fat and blood is useful for us. And with calorie restriction, the triglycerides dropped significantly. Now, there was not a significant change in their cholesterol levels. In fact, the cholesterol levels dropped significantly, but I'm not sure that this is such a beneficial aspect. And I think this happened mostly because of the type of diet that these people were eating. So I want to move on from calorie restriction now. So I have shown you what calorie restriction is. But now I want to help you figure out why we feel hungry. Because if you understand hunger, you will be able to restrict your calories. So let's take a look at what causes us to be hungry. Now there are many factors, 
But one of the most important factors that makes us hungry is a hormone that gets released at the sight, smell, and thought of food, and that is ghrelin. So ghrelin is released by the stomach. It goes and acts in the brain and makes you eat. It, it starts your eating behavior. The ghrelin also is modulated to some degree by another nerve that is going from the stomach called the vagus nerve. We will not get into that. So let's see how ghrelin is released. So this is a person who is eating breakfast here, lunch here, and dinner here. At this time is midnight. So the thought of breakfast, the ghrelin starts going up pretty rapidly. It reaches its peak. But the most important thing I'm trying to make you aware of is that it takes about 60 minutes to an hour for this ghrelin to come down. And many people postulate that as the ghrelin goes up, so does insulin. And that rise of insulin is actually the stimulus that makes the ghrelin go away. I'd like to argue that there are other factors that can do that too. So the group took to try to figure out how powerful is ghrelin in making us eat. So they took nine healthy individuals, they gave them ghrelin intravenously, and also at another time they gave them saline to see how much food they would eat when ghrelin was given and how much they would eat when saline was given. And these individuals were taken to a, a buffet lunch and they found that they ate substantially more calories when they were given ghrelin. So here is the graph. The saline group ate this many kilocalories. The ghrelin group ate a lot more. Over a period of one day, they ate almost 550 more calories. Every single person who was given ghrelin compared to saline ate more. So it was not like ghrelin was making one person eat more and not another person eat more. They also looked at the visual interpretation of hunger by these people, looking at food, who was more hungry? Looking at food before infusion, the hunger was the same. But after infusion, the hunger was a lot more, the perception, the thought of food and the hunger through visual cues was a lot more in people who were on ghrelin. Now here is an important aspect. When you fast, when you're doing fasting, our body is on a circadian rhythm cycle. It knows night and day. And what happens is that during fasting, even when you're not eating at lunchtime, at dinner time, at breakfast time, the ghrelin levels are going up. This is the median, this is the top group, this is the bottom group in terms of ghrelin production. So if you look at an average, there are peaks at the time of lunch, dinner, and breakfast. There is a midnight peak also that is responsible for releasing growth hormone. So there are two important aspects about ghrelin and fasting. One is that ghrelin is still released when you're fasting. The second aspect is that the ghrelin is coming down on its own without an increase in insulin. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is that if you ignore ghrelin, if you cognitively say, hey, I'm fasting and I, I cannot have any food, if you ignore the stimulus to eat through cognitive control, the ghrelin will go down. The third important thing that this is showing you is that over a 24 hour period, the direction of ghrelin is coming lower. So in other words, with fasting, the hunger stimulus is declining, not continuously increasing. So before you go off and say, hey, I know how to master ghrelin, I want to share with you one other information. And that is, what do ghrelin levels do when you lose weight? Do they come up? Do they go down? 
So this group took a group of people who were overweight and heavy, and they did diet-induced weight loss, not the kind of diet we recommend, just calorie restriction. And then another group of people, uh, to five of them, they did gastric bypass surgery and measured ghrelin levels. So let's see what happened. So this is the group with diet-induced weight loss. They lost their body weight substantially. This is in kilograms, which is a humongous amount, about 17 kilograms. They preserved their muscle mass because compared to their body weight, their non-fat mass increased. Their abdominal fat dropped by almost 50% their insulin worked better, their blood pressures went down. But the reason I'm showing this to you is that when you lose weight, the ghrelin levels go up. This is the ghrelin levels with them being heavy. These are ghrelin levels after they lost weight. The other important thing that I'm showing this graph to you is that the ghrelin levels uh, are taking approximately 90 minutes for them to come to their trough levels, to come to their nadir, to their lowest point. So after they peak, they don't come down within like 20, 30 minutes. It can take up to 60 to 90 minutes for them to come down. So your hunger stimulus, the reason why we overeat is because our biology is designed to make us overeat. Now, when you do gastric bypass surgery, you remove a portion of the stomach that's making ghrelin. So these are people who went through gastric bypass surgery. The ghrelin levels were very low, which is what you would expect. But before you say, hey, I want to conquer my hunger by going and getting gastric bypass surgery, I want you to think twice because stomach is very important for our health for many different reasons. And one of the reasons here is that the ghrelin is making, so this is ghrelin levels here in the, in the solid line, and these are growth hormone levels. The rise in ghrelin stimulates growth hormone release, which is very important for our health. So I have spent about 30 minutes talking to you about why calorie restriction is important. I've spent a few minutes of those talking about the biology of hunger, what makes us hunger, how long would we, would we be hungry for? And now I'm getting on to a little bit of uncharted territory because this is not my expertise, but I have counseled patients a lot and I've been practicing the skill for about seven years in counseling and on myself. So I think that I understand partially the habits and the behavior and how to modulate it. So not only do I want to tell you that calorie restriction is important and how it helps, not only do I want to tell you what the biology of hunger is, but I want to give you techniques and tricks on how to eat less. So in order to do that, I want to use the work of James Clear. Now, I've read many books on habit formation. Uh, Charles Duhigg uh, wrote a book called The Power of Habit, which I read from cover to cover. And I have heard James Clear, and I have read this book of his from cover to cover as well. And what Mr. Clear says is that a habit has four different components. There's a cue that leads to a craving that creates a certain behavior, which is response that leads to gratification or reward. So let's take these four aspects that are driving our food intake and apply them to food. So the cue is the sight, smell, and thought of food. The craving comes when you see that cue. The cue is what is leading to this craving inside your brain saying that, hey, I want to eat. And that craving is happening because your ghrelin levels are going out of control. 
the response is the act of eating and the reward is the gratification that you get from eating that food. So this is a loop. Uh, it feeds on itself. Uh, the cue leads to craving, leads to a response, leads to a reward. And this behavior is repeated because it's creating gratification. So here is what James Clear says that if you want to create a good habit, you should make the cue obvious, make it present in your environment. If you want to make the craving of a good habit present, make it attractive. If you want to do that behavior, make it easy and make it satisfying. Now you have to inverse that. So for our purposes, we want to eat less. We don't want to have wrong cravings. We want to make it difficult. We need to have a commitment device that we're going to do intermittent fasting. And I'll explain that in a bit. And we need to make it not satisfying. However, I want to modulate all of this for you to see whether it can help you create some better eating habits. So dealing with Q, one of the first things that I tell is that remove the Q from your environment. If I'm working in my office, I don't want to have food available here. I want it not present. At home, clear your pantry of all the junk food. And even the good food that you're eating, you're going to overeat. So you need to have techniques to avoid that. So keep just the amount of food that you need to eat and don't have more. In other words, make it less available. Spend a substantial amount of time in a place where there is no food available for you so that the practice and act of fasting becomes easier. It's very difficult in our environment. What about craving? How do you deal with craving, which is the second aspect of uh, habit formation? We already said, eliminate the cues. Knowing that the cue is causing the craving is important. Understanding the biology that ghrelin is leading to that craving for food will help you. Understanding the biology that if you ignore ghrelin for about 20 to 60 minutes, your hunger will go away. So in other words, not like hunger will last forever. If you ignore the craving, the ghrelin will say, I want to take a hike. This person is not listening to me. I'm going to go away. I want to take the example of a Muslim fast. These people fast from sunrise to sunset. At this time, that's up nearly 16 hours. They have no food, no water. These people are not fat adapted. They are not on a low carb diet. The reason they are able to do that is because through cognitive control, they are able to control their craving. And another reason they are able to do that is because this is a group of people who are fasting together for a religious reason. So in, a, in other words, I'm trying to plug in my group here. If you join a group that practices fasting, if you join a group that promotes a certain behavior, that behavior can be fostered and it'll be easier for you to stick to that behavior. I'm almost coming to the end. Now, the third law, which is the act of eating, how do you get rid of that? And for that, I wanna take the story of Odysseus and the Sirens that I got from Goldstein from a TED talk and many of us have read about the Odysseus story in high school or junior high. And Odysseus was this big hero who won the, the war and he was going back home. And they knew that they were going to pass through this island where there were the sirens. These sirens are these beautiful women that sing an enchanting song. And any sailor that listens to the song will jump out of the ship, go to the shores and get hit by the rocks and will perish. And Odysseus is telling to his mates that, hey, listen, we're going to tomorrow pass through that island and I want to listen to that song. 
and I want to listen, but still live. So what I'm going to do is to put ear wax in all your ears so that you can't listen to the song. And he tells the first mate that you're going to tie me to the mast as shown out here. And as we pass, I'm going to listen to the song. And your job is that no matter what I do, what kind of actions I do, you're not going to untie me so that I will not jump out of the ship and go to the shores and perish. So you would think that for such an important act, like Goldstein is describing, that there would be a rehearsal. So Odysseus gets tied up to the mast and he tells the first mate, you know, I want to go to the sirens, release me, release me, cut me loose. And the first mate wisely does not cut his hands, uh, cut his rope that is tying his hands. And after some time, Odysseus says, I see that you get it. Now let's stop this rehearsal, let cut, cut the rope and let's get some supper. And the first mate cuts the rope and Odysseus flips out and says, you idiot, if you do it at that time, all of us will be dead. And so really what I'm trying to use this analogy for is that this is one of the first descriptions of what is called a commitment device. So in other words, in order not to do that act, you need to have a commitment device. You need to enroll people in helping you. You need to tell yourself that, hey, I'm gonna eat less. This is a commitment device that I'm making. So at the time that I have this temptation in front of me, I would be able to resist it. Now let's look at the fourth law very briefly. And the fourth law is make it less satisfying. And that is difficult because humans are wired for immediate gratification. I have a donut in front of me. It is sugary, it's very tasty. It's gonna give me immediate gratification to eat it and not eating it whether it's a cookie or a donut, uh, will help me in the future, but the future is not here. The temptation is here. The future does not have anything arguing for it because not eating the cookie will make me perhaps not a diabetic, not obese. And so in the presence of temptation, it gets trounced every single time because humans are wired for immediate gratification. So what I want to do is to give you a strategy. Just to tell you that good habits are not immediately rewarding. Fasting will not improve your health overnight. It may take several weeks. Eating less will not make you lose weight in a day. It may take several months. Calorie restriction will not drop your blood pressure right away. It may take months of practice. So in order for these good habits to be fostered, create an immediate reward. And this is how I want to propose and this is how I do it. So when I eat less or continue fasting, I make a small deposit in an account. This is my immediate gratification for eating less so that this behavior is fostered. And over time, I see that this habit be reinforced by the money growing. And for me, it's buying a bicycle. For my friend's daughter that I just mentioned, she may make a pact with her father saying that every time she practices these good habits that he will deposit $100 in her account. I mean, I'm just making that number up. So this is what I propose that I want you to consider with all these techniques that I have told you to eat when you're eating, to eat when you are up till 70% full. So in other words, I want you to get up from the table when you're hungry. Now this is gonna be very difficult because ghrelin is raging, it's not come down. It's uncomfortable to get up from the table when you're still hungry, but practicing that is knowing that you're doing something good for your health and also the knowledge 
that ghrelin takes about 20 to 60 minutes for it to go away. And at times when you're fasting, avoid the cues so that your fasting would be promoted. Use all the knowledge that we have acquired today to deal with cravings. Formulate a commitment device, just like Odysseus did when he was going through the island where the sirens were. So that in the time of temptation, that commitment device will help you not give in. And finally, make eating less and fasting. In other words, getting up, like today, if I get up from the table 70% full and 30% empty, in other words, I get up from the table hungry, I'm going to put $5 in my account to get a new bicycle that will give me pleasure down the road. So I want to ask myself, did I meet my objectives? The objectives that I laid out today was that is calorie restriction an important health practice? And I'd like to tell you that it is. I hope that I gave you some idea about the biology of hunger and why we are designed to overeat. And I'm not sure whether I met with the, with the last objective about the practical framework to create a better habit to achieve the goals that I outlined. So I'm gonna stop sharing my slides here. I'm gonna post all these slides. You're gonna get the slides. Uh, this presentation is gonna go on the fastingmethod.com in a couple of days. Uh, the um, article that I have written that's explaining everything will also get on there. So you will have these resources. Uh, Melissa may uh, post it on YouTube. So I enjoy doing this because I am committed to uh, giving you new information and new techniques. Over the last seven years, I have learned a lot. And um, I hope to give you newer and newer ideas to improve your health. Thank you, and I'm going to sign off here and end at this point. Take care.